No, it's not. <laughs> but thank, thank you for thinking of us. <laughs> oh, uh, we're, we're at a balmy nine degrees right now. So, um, yes, we. It's not as cold as it is there, I'm sure, but it's uh, it's not toasty either. Um, so, Port of Alaska. I guess I talked to you what just about a year ago, right? I think we did get an update mid-year last year, but you, certainly it's been some months. Yes, sir. Yeah. We, we have had a few developments, so I guess I want to keep this conversational, so don't be afraid to pop in with questions um, as we're moving into this thing. But uh, Jomo, if you want to advance to the first slide, we'll, uh, we'll get her going. Okay. So it's not old news, but um, Port of Alaska is a municipality of Anchorage owned facility, uh, owned and operated. It opened up back in 1961. And uh, when it was opened up, it was opened up for the main reason of getting some fresh food into Anchorage. At the time, Seward was the main inbound cargo port for the state of Alaska. Uh, that's why the highway starts there, the Iditarod Trail starts there, the railroad starts in Seward. Seward was the way you got stuff into Anchorage or into Alaska and Anchorage opened up a port mainly so that we could get uh, semi-fresh groceries into Anchorage. Anchorage was already the population center at that point. Um, in 2017, the Anchorage Assembly renamed us Port of Alaska, um, mainly to help raise funding for the, the port replacement program or the dock replacement program. If you wanna to move to the next slide. Yeah. So the, the trick with Alaska, well, we need to talk about the state in general. We are a we have very little agriculture, we have very little manufacturing. So most of the consumer goods and food that we use or eat has to be brought into the state. Um, we are a virtual island. We have no uh, rail connection, we have no pipeline connection, we have one road. Um, about 90% of the stuff that we bring into the state comes in by either a ship or a barge. Um, if air flies less than five percent. Oh, you garbled a little bit there, Jim. percent comes in by air, less than 5% comes in by truck. Um, most of the food that uh, is shipped in more than 5 million TEUs in 2019 is carried either by Matson or Tote, and it came from Tacoma. So keep in mind that our real connection with the world is Tacoma. Um, Alaska, mostly port of Anchorage, accounts for uh, 20% of all the freight that leaves Tacoma every year. So, you know, we're a big and an important piece of Tacoma's business also. Uh, if you want to move to the next slide. I didn't realize we were such a substantial portion of their outbound. Yeah, and that's actually a pretty important fact because it gives us a real asset or an ally when we're uh, trying to get federal money for our projects and our food because we are really their biggest single customer. Um, so Port of Alaska is the primary inbound cargo handling facility for the state of Alaska. Uh, we are not the biggest port by a long time. Do I have any guesses on what the biggest port is by tonnage? Valdez. Valdez, number one, which is export uh, for petroleum. Number two is Nikiski, again, export petroleum. Number three is Red Dog Mine. So export of uh, zinc in the mining uh, product. So the first three ports in the state by tonnage are all specialty export facilities. We are an inbound cargo facility. We handle 4.3 million tons. 90% of Alaskans use products that have shipped across our dock on a weekly basis. Um, more than 80% of all the vans and containers that come into the state uh, or come into South Central Alaska come across our dock. Um, we're 75% of all the non-petroleum cargo shipped into the state. Um, half of what is shipped across our dock, uh, or we take in half of all the inbound cargo into Alaska comes across our dock 
and about half of that redistributed outside of Anchorage, the final destinations outside of Anchorage. So that was more than $14 billion worth of commercial activity last year. Uh, you want to go to the next slide? So the basic uh, distribution is that the materials come into Anchorage and then they ship out from Anchorage to the final destination. One thing to keep in mind when you're talking about ports is nobody ships anything to a port. They always ship it to a user and the users for the most part are not at ports. So ports are just a link in the supply chain. That's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, so about 80% of our cargo is low down in cargo. Want to hit the next slide, Gemma? There we go. So, um, Port of Alaska is the state's most versatile port in terms of the uh, types of materials that it can handle. As I said, Valdez, Nikiski, and Red Dog are all bigger than us, uh, but they're all, all bulk export, either liquid bulk or dry bulk. Um, in the case of Port of Alaska, we have three general cargo terminals. They handle lift on, lift off, roll on, roll off, and brake bulk uh, freight. We have liquid bulk in the form of two petroleum terminals. We have dry bulk in the form of cement terminal. We have a dry barge landing, and we handle cruise ships. So we basically handle every type of freight material and uh, product that ports anywhere handle. So we are the state's most versatile port, and that's an important thing to keep in mind because we don't really have a backup. There is not another port in the state that can handle everything. You want to go to the next slide, please. So um, in order for a port to work, you really need three things. You need to have proximity to market. You need to have the appropriate infrastructure to handle the, the cargo and passengers that you're handling. And you have to have transportation connections because as I said, ports are never the final destination. Uh, so here at Port of Alaska, we have 125 acres of cargo handling infrastructure that are actually belong to the port, plus we're surrounded by uh, several hundred additional acres of railroad owned land that are also used for port like uh, activities. We have 3.4 million barrels of fuel storage, we have 60,000 tons of cement storage, we have all of the cargo handling infrastructure, the, the dock cranes, the uh, roll on roll off ramps. Uh, dock siders for handling cement systems, all that sort of thing. The other thing that we have that when people go, oh, well, why don't you go to Whittier? Why don't you go to um, Seward? We have a workforce. Um, the small communities do not have the workforce that is needed on a ship day. So we have two ship days a week, Sundays and Tuesdays, when we have two container ships. Each container ship brings in about 600 containers, ships out about uh, 600 containers. We bring on somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand extra workers who aren't on the port on a daily basis in order to handle those ships. And that's a big number to keep in mind. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, as I said, we are at the populate the, if you need three things, you need to be close to uh, your market. We're at the population center of the state. Um, we are also the transportation hub for the state, or we have all the infrastructure, I mentioned that, and then we are also the transportation hub for the state. We are the point where marine meets marine, It's not unusual for containers to come across our dock, drive a quarter mile down the road, get loaded onto a Linden barge or uh, a North Star, or down to the North Star terminal and get loaded onto a barge to go out to Western Alaska. We are where um, the docks meet the road system 75% of all Alaskans live on roads that are connected to Port of Alaska. We are where um, the docks meet rail. We have 2.2 miles of rail on the port and we're immediately adjacent to the main rail loading yard for the state of Alaska. We are at the point where rail meets air. I can stand on my dock and watch, or actually I can see the FedEx and UPS cargo terminals and I have to duck so that the J-Bear jets don't uh, hit us in the head as they're coming into their final approach right over our dock. Uh, and we're where um, docks meet the main pipeline system for uh, refined petroleum products. Our valve yard connects our two fuel docks, our 3.4 million barrels of fuel storage, J-Bear, 
Head Stevens International Airport, and all of the fuel infrastructure down in Nikiski. It all comes together at our dock. And then we also have road and rail connections to bring fuel up to your area. So we are the place where all of, all of the transportation centers for the state come together. You wanna go to the next slide, please? So the port really has three basic functions. Uh, the main function, and it's the function where, that earns all of our revenue, is commerce. The second function is national defense. Uh, national defense doesn't generate any revenue, but it does uh, protect the country, and it also generates a lot of economic activity for the state of Alaska. And then the third one is what I'll call earthquake resiliency disaster response. Um, you know, the main reason Port of Alaska is the main port for the state is because we survived the 64 earthquake. Uh, during the 64 earthquake, every other port in South Central Alaska was wiped out, not by the, um, by the earthquake, but by the tsunamis. And we'll talk about that a little bit in just a second. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. In terms of commerce, um, that's the, the business of bringing fuel and freight into the state. Uh, it's where the port makes all of its money. And just so that you know, the port, if we were a private business, we have been cash positive since the 1964 earthquake. Um, meaning if we were a private business, you'd say we were profitable. Um, no tax dollars go into the operation of the port. It pays for itself. Um, the tax money that's spent here is purely for infrastructure you know, things like security improvements, and right now we're looking for money to place the docks. Um, about 90% of the liquid fuel shipped into South Central Alaska crosses our dock and is distributed uh, throughout the road system. 80% um, of all the cement used in the state, that goes up or down a little bit from year to year, depending on the projects that are being built, but about 80% of the cement shipped into the state comes across our dock. Any guesses on what the three biggest cement using projects in the State were last year? Ileson. Well, we just heard Ileson. Ileson was, one. they were number two. So, uh, Ileson for F 35 infrastructure. Number one was the Liberty Energy Project, that island they're building up off of the North Slope. Number three was the gold mine. Um, the, the oil fields, they use methanol. We have a 70,000 barrel methanol tank. Methanol is what they put down hole up on the North Slope and actually out in Cook Inlet also to keep the wells from freezing up in the wintertime and they put it into the pipelines to keep the oil flowing. So basically our whole state's economy is relying on products that are coming across our dock. You want to go to the next slide, please? Uh, on the national defense front, um, about 20% of all the cargo that ships into our state is somehow DOD related, you know, either troop deployments or uh, food for the commissary. Uh, we are one of 17 US Department of Defense uh, commercial strategic seaports. Um, basically, we are considered essential for the DOD mission in Alaska, in the Pacific Rim, and in the Arctic. And when you look at this map, you can see that we're really all by ourselves up here in terms of supporting the Defense Department. You wanna to go to the next slide, please? Um, part of the reason- Does Hawaii get a pass just because of Pearl Harbor? They have such a large harbor for their uh, military assets? No, well, different, big, big difference. Pearl Harbor has a strategic port, but that's a military port. We're a commercial strategic seaport. So if you go back uh, one to the, the slide with the map, there are, I, I forget what the total number is. I think it's 24 strategic seaports. Uh, I may have that number wrong, but um, there, there's a difference in the purely military ports versus uh, commercial ports that the military uses. So right. Hawaii, Pearl Harbor is a military base. So that's not counted on here. Got it. There are no military bases up in Alaska uh, or military uh, ports in Alaska. So the only thing they have is Port of Alaska up here. Okay. Okay, uh, so if we wanna to go to the next one, this slide actually does a, a pretty good job of showing um, why we are central to uh, the, 
national defense, you can see we are within nine and a half hours by air of 90% of the industrial world. So from both a business and a military strategy perspective, if you're trying to fly cargo someplace, Anchorage is a key or Alaska is a key piece of that puzzle because we can get everywhere quickly. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. So our, our quiet, uh, the role that a lot of people forget about is our natural disaster and uh, resiliency and response. Um, we are, because we are so important to feeding the state, in fact, that Alaska is a just-in-time delivery state, depending on where you are, if the ship stops sailing into Anchorage, we have six to 10 days until you're out of food. Um, as a result, we really need to uh, either have a backup system or have uh, resiliency here at Port of Alaska. You know, redundancy is the most common um, way that ports get resiliency. So for instance, if the port of Tacoma goes down, it's a bad day. But the nice thing is they have ports in Seattle, Olympia, Bremerton, Everett, Bellingham, uh, Anacortes, Port Angeles, uh, Vancouver, down on the Columbia River, there are nine ports. There are lots of redundant ports that are on the same road system, the same rail system, the same pipeline system. They can step in and um, fill in for Tacoma if it goes down. If Port of Alaska goes down, we do not have a redundant port. Um, we do have Whittier. Whittier, for instance, does not have a deep water dock. We do have Seward. Seward doesn't have ramps or cranes. Um, they don't have the backups. On top of that, they're in tsunami prone areas. Um, as I said, Port of Alaska was the only port that survived the 64 earthquake because the tsunamis took every other port out in South Central Alaska. Upper Cook Inlet is geographically tsunami proof. The shape of the inlet, the way it gets wider, narrower, shallower, deeper, basically makes it so that we can't have a tsunami up here. Um, so it's really a key role is our earthquake resilience. If you wanna to go to the next slide, please. But we did have an earthquake, as you remember, back at the uh, end of 2018. And uh, while the port never closed, we had one fuel ship that had to stand by with about 2,600 barrels of product still on the dock after the earthquake while we tested our fuel lines to make sure everything worked. But that was our only operational delay. Unfortunately, it wasn't our only, uh, or we, we had a lot of damage that we didn't realize at the time. Uh, it was very difficult to inspect the docks because of the winter ice conditions. So when we got under the dock in April, all those little red dock, dots on this dock picture represent um, various problems that we have. If you go to the next slide, uh, our aging, uh, port were uh, built on top of about 1600 piles that have been corroding. Um, it's a common uh, condition in northern waters. It's called accelerated low water corrosion. There's a, a microbe that lives in the mud in cold water that uh, accelerates the rust rate in the area that gets exposure at low tide. And it turns out that construction techniques from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s actually made this worse because the welds rust faster. So we had spiral seams break. Uh, I call those our Pillsbury failures. You know how you have the Pillsbury uh, muffins that you slap on the counter and they pop? That's what our piles did. We had butt welds break. Butt welds are where you take two short pieces of pile. It's on the right hand side there and weld them together to make a long piece of pile and all of a sudden they weren't connected. I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, we had seam failures that were running um, 30, 40 feet up and down the, the pile. And the trick is if, you know, you have one or two pile failures underneath our dock with 1,600 piles, 1,600 plus piles, um, the other piles all take the load up. It's not, you know, it's a bad day, but it's not that big a deal. Where it becomes a problem is when you have clusters of piles because that's where progressive failures can start. If you wanna hit the next slide. 
then we also had things like our fender piles uh, breaking off. The fenders are those uh, piles at the front of the dock that the ships uh, push up against. So we've, we've repaired everything that broke during the earthquake. That we had a busy last summer. Um, so we have put steel jackets on everything and repaired it, but we're still not what I would call a healthy port. Um, we're more than half a century old and our docks are probably within 10 years of having to be um, closed due to loss of load bearing capacity. Do you wanna hit the next slide? So our, our re dock replacement program is called uh, the Port of Alaska Modernization Program. It is not an expansion program. Uh, in fact, we'll probably end up with a little less dock than we have now. Um, and the real goals of the dock are to replace the, the dock before it fails. Uh, we want to make it a safer dock. The, we would not be allowed to build the dock that we built in 1964 just because back then they did not have marine construction standards or seismic standards. Um, and for instance, if you stand on our dock today, if you're on the south end of the dock, you're about a foot and a half lower than you are on the north end because uh, the piles were too short and it's sinking into the mud. Uh, we want to accommodate modern shipping standards. Ships have gotten a lot bigger since the 1960s. Uh, as a result, we need to have deeper berths and we need to have, be able to handle cranes that reach out across wider ships or taller ships. Uh, and then of course, we want to improve our seismic resiliency so that uh, we know the port will survive a significant uh, earthquake. I'm gonna hit the next slide. You've probably heard the, the $2 billion figure. I don't think we actually have a $2 billion project. I think it's probably closer to a billion dollars. That $2 billion number that uh, was being bantied about last year, that was back in 2014, 2016. All the port users got together when they thought somebody else was gonna pay for it and uh, determined exactly what they wanted for a dock. Uh, and that blue sky dock, I'll call it, was a $2 billion project. Now that we're, um, we've reached the realization that Alaskans are gonna have to pay for most of this dock, they're downsizing it. We're still figuring out exactly what, what we're building for a main, main cargo dock. But as a result, the project's being downsized. I think it's gonna be closer to a billion dollars. It's still a huge project. When you look at the length of the piles that we need, uh, you can see how tall a building we're effectively building and how long it is. I mean, it's 10 football fields long. This is a big project. There is no way to make it cheap. You wanna to go to the next slide? So we are moving forward. Can you hit the next slide, General? General? Sir, sorry, I had you on mute. Um, could we just pause one moment? I just wanted to see if anyone had any questions since we got into the money portion. Okay. Okay, how much has currently been approved? How much well, I'm about to start talking about the, uh, what we're, do where we are on that. Um, can we hold that question for about 60 seconds? Sure. Okay, so if you hit the next slide, we are moving forward with our first new dock. Um, it's the petroleum and cement terminal. It's going to be south of the existing dock. Uh, we are under contract. So in 2020, we're going to do the first phase of in-water construction. That will be the trestle and the deck. 2021, we'll come back, put the mooring dolphins on it, and then all of the infrastructure for handling fuel and cement. Um, that project, the total project, the original engineer's estimate for it was going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 215, 216 million dollars. Um, that includes all of the shoreside improvements that had to be made. Uh, and we've already done all the shoreside work. We did all the transitional dredging last summer. Um, this summer's project for that trestle and for the deck, um, when we contracted it, we actually got a, a much better price than we had expected. And that work is going to be $42.1 million. Pacific Pile and Marine is, is building that this summer. 
And we are within a couple of weeks of going out to contract for the remaining portion of the dock, the part that will be built in summer of 2021. That's all the mooring dolphins and then all of the piping and the hose infrastructure and the cement uh, infrastructure that will be up on the top of the dock. And, you know, ask me in June how much that's going to cost. Um, the initial projection for the whole project was $216 million. We did raise our tariffs in on January 1st in order to start collecting uh, money from the fuel and the cement users to um, uh, repay a bond that will be used to build this project. Uh, we've also gotten a number of grants for it. I think we are somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 million in state money, and we just got a $25 million um, federal uh, transportation grant last fall for it. So we are offsetting a significant portion of this dock with uh, federal money. Our basic um, philosophy for how to pay for this is cost causer, cost payer. So for instance, with the petroleum and cement dock, that will be paid for by the petroleum and cement users. It won't be paid for by the container users, the totes and the matsons of the world. Uh, they're going to have their own project coming up here um, when we're doing the cargo dock. When we build the cargo dock, the container guys will pay for that and the, the cement and petroleum users will not be paying for that. If you want to go to the next slide. Actually, if you don't mind, Jeff, did they answer your question, Julia? Uh, we can look back around at the end if there's more. Well, if your big question is what, you know, how much is the project going to cost? That I can't tell you right now because when that $2 billion number came out, people were justifiably alarmed. Um, and basically we said, okay, um, we, we know what we're not doing. We're not building a $2 billion uh, dock for the simple reason we don't have $2 billion. Um, so now what we're doing is we are replacing the petroleum and cement terminal. Right now we have two petroleum terminals there. They are the two most at risk facilities at the port in terms of damage that they sustained during the earthquake and damage from aging. So once that dock is replaced, that will let us move north. And if you look at this picture, you see POL1, that stands for Petroleum Oil and Lubricant 1, and T1 is Terminal 1. Those two docks, it, it's sort of one dock, sort of two docks. They're the oldest part of our facility. We know that the next thing that's going to happen is those two docks will be demolished and we will start building a new uh, container terminal there. The big question is, are we going to build one dock or two? So, Tote and Matson both bring two ships a weekend and those ships turn in less than a day. So that's four days of, of use. Um, Right now, they bring them in on Sundays and Tuesdays. We're in serious discussion about, do we really need two container terminals? Or can we just go with one and have Tote and Matson adjust their schedules? Um, and it's not as easy a question as you would think because of the supply chain logistics work. Um, one terminal would complicate things considerably. Uh, first of all, you would have to have a really well choreographed schedule and every time you get a weather delay, that would mess up your, your schedule. So it's very likely, for example, if we only had one dock, we would have lots of gaps in our service where all of a sudden Fred Meyer would not have fresh lettuce. Um, because if your fresh lettuce was coming in on a Matson ship, but the tote ship that was there the day before got delayed by six hours because of the weather, you know, it ends up backing up the whole schedule. Um, we are in those discussions right now. Uh, actually, we're about to start recruiting um, members from across the state, including Fairbanks, to sit in on a, um, I, it, we haven't really come up with what we're gonna call it yet. It's not a board, but a group of, um, basically it will be a consumer uh, group that will be following the design project and determining, boy, is this really the way we should be building this dock? Or should we be spending more money on, say, resiliency or 
Um, the idea is we want to have statewide input into how do we optimize this facility so that it meets the, the three needs, the commerce need, the military need, and the resiliency need. Um, and then at the same time, we also need to have the three basic users pony up the money because we're using that cost cause or cost payer model. If the Department of Defense says, yes, we would love to have two docs, uh, we'll say, great. Can we have your share, your contribution, uh, some sort of a grant to pay for the extra doc that the DOD needs? And that's the conversation we're having right now. Does that answer your funding question? Um, pretty much. It tells me that things are in flux and it's coming in from it, Yeah, what it sounded like uh, she was asking was how much cash on hand? Okay, well, basically we have enough cash on hand right now to um, build the petroleum cement terminal with a relatively small bond. Uh, depending on, on exactly how much we, we end up having to, uh, uh, or how much the, the second phase of the construction work costs, you know, we may have to go out for a bond that would be somewhere in the, I don't know, um, 60 to $75 million range. And that's the bond that will have to be repaid uh, using um, tariffs collected on fuel and cement. Uh, and as I said, our tariff has already started increasing. It's going to be phased in over the next 10 years. Um, and we did that because that will give us the opportunity to adjust. If we get a, a really smoking hot deal on building the, the final water work, well, that, that means we won't have to do the last tariff increases. On the other hand, if it costs us more than our engineers have estimated, we have 10 years in order to, to add that add a little extra tariff without creating a huge bump in um, the Alaska economy so that we can still repay it. In terms of money that we have uh, in hand for the container docks, not much. Now we have done quite a bit of work already in terms of permitting um, seismic studies, the um, geotechnical work. So a lot of the um, pre-design work has already been accomplished. But we are going to have to be raising money, and we're going to be probably looking at tariff increases as soon as next year to start paying for the container dock work as we're moving forward. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Um, well, if you hit the next slide, that's basically it. Um, <laughs> So that was a well-timed question. Um, you know, I guess the, the short version is we have a dock that uh, has served Alaska well. It basically carries our economy. Uh, you know, as I said, half of all the inbound freight that comes into this, or half of the state's inbound freight crosses our dock. Half of that gets distributed elsewhere in the state. But the problem is it's failing. It's within 10 years of falling into the ocean or at least uh, having to be closed due to lack of load bearing. Uh, that's not because of poor management, that's just because it's old. Um, you know, the fact that it survived the uh, 2018 earthquake with relatively few hiccups really is a tribute to how well that dock has run. Um, the, the engineers and the folks who are doing the work to keep that thing in service have actually done a, an amazing job, uh, but it needs to be replaced because it's old. Um, and we don't have a good backup plan right now. You know, I hear people talking about, well, let's go to Seward, let's go to Whittier. Those, those ports fail for a number of reasons. They don't have all the transportation connections. They have single points of failure. How many, how many bridges could fail during an earthquake that would render steward unconnected to the rest of the state. Um, you know, they don't have the adequate facilities, they don't have um, the workforce, and it's really not probably a great idea to try to develop those things, because if you develop them, uh, for instance, in the case of Seward, according to McDowell, the average container would have seven and a half hours of extra travel time 
uh, between Seward and its final destination. Well, how much does that end up costing us as Alaskans, you know, you as folks up in Fairbanks, to have to add seven and a half hours of driving time to every one of your containers? It, it would make things more expensive. Right now, Anchorage is the optimum place for having our inbound cargo handling. Because it's got, it's got that magic mix of proximity to markets, infrastructure, and transportation connections. And it's tsunami proof. So our best deal, or our best bet, we think, is to replace the docks with a rational and reasonable dock. And that's what we're trying to move forward with right now. And I expect Jomo is going to be getting a phone call probably within the next month asking for ideas about who from Fairbanks uh, could sit in on this group uh, to help vet the process for us of cargo dock design. Mr. Prox? Uh, yeah, a couple questions. Okay. You, you talked about single points of failure, Seward, et cetera. What are beyond the dock to get stuff from Anchorage to Fairbanks and everywhere else that's got to cross a couple of bridges and there must be some points. Well, there, there are absolutely single points of failure all over the state. I mean, we are a, we are a perfect example, but Fairbanks, we have, um, for instance, three different systems for getting up to you. We can send stuff up by rail, we can send stuff up by road, and in a pinch, we could fly things up. Um, a lot of folks go, oh yeah, flying, that's the way to do it. Um, flying really is not a sustainable fix for reaching whether it be Fairbanks or Anchorage. Um, I know a lot of people have told me, well, I don't know why we're so worried about it. You know, we've got this really super cargo airport. It's the fifth busiest cargo airport in the world. We can certainly handle all this cargo there. Um, right now, Ted Stevens International Airport has 500 wide body cargo jet landings a week on average. In order to replace one week's worth of sea lift that comes into Port of Alaska, that would be 700 additional flights. It couldn't handle it. The system would break. Um, you know, so, build a second deck on the runway. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I want to land on the first deck then. Ah, <laughs> uh, you're seeing the problems, not the solution. Yeah. The, the other one was uh, uh, there, there will be discussion about Port Mackenzie across the port from Anchorage. Uh -huh. How does uh, that fit into the picture? Well, I mean, frankly, it doesn't. Uh, first of all, Port Mackenzie was built as a wood chip export facility. Um, it does not have any, in, any significant inbound cargo handling capacity. Uh, it's got no ramps, it's got no cranes. It's built at kind of an odd angle to the current so that ships do not dock there for an extended period of time, especially in the wintertime uh, when the ice is flowing. Uh, the currents will use the ship off of the dock or push the ship into the dock. Um, it's really not a functioning facility. But on top of that, so you don't have any of the infrastructure and dock infrastructure for handling uh, in a sustainable fashion, uh, inbound cargo. You also have no rail, rail connection. You have no pipeline connection. The, they have 3,000 acres of, of you know, port uplands. The problem is, is those uplands are 180 vertical feet above the dock, so that every single container that comes off of the ship is immediately going to have to drive up 180 foot uh, vertical Paul Hill. Um, the rail loading yard that they proposed to build is two and a half miles from the dock. It's on the port, but it's two and a half miles from the dock, 180 feet above the dock. Uh, logistically, that's a really tough move, especially in the wintertime, you know, when you have a marine environment having to drive up an icy road pulling those containers. Um, it, it doesn't work. Um, the, the facility's not there and it doesn't make sense to build it there uh, because even after you have all the infrastructure for inbound cargo, you're still two hours farther from most of your destination. Right. Okay. Okay, further questions? I missed what you said about um, 
the design as an export facility for what product or products? Uh, when they uh, when they originally built it, the idea was to export wood chips. Um, so it's got a conveyor system on it for wood chip export. Uh, they got it all built. They tested it. It worked fine. And then they uh, discovered they did not have a source of wood chips. Um, mm. So then the next idea was, okay, they would uh, revamp it for coal. Uh, they did one test with coal. They determined that the uh, conveyor system was too light for coal. It was designed for wood chips. So in order to export coal, um, they would have to change the conveyor system. They would also, of course, have to have the rail connection. They would be competing with the state-owned or the Alaska Railroad-owned coal dock that's in Seward. And oh, by the way, the international coal market has collapsed and Seward has mothballed its coal facility. So the, the likelihood that they're going to be exporting coal is you know, pretty low. I had a, a brief odd question from early on in the presentation where you mentioned that Anchorage uh, or the uh, Alaska port has some cruise ships. Uh -huh. I hadn't realized they could get into Anchorage. Is that just a, a minor blip? It, there are easier ways to get to Anchorage, but I wondered if... That is a uh, very minor blip. That, you know, the trick with back during the port intermodal expansion program, um, they had thought about building a cruise ship terminal here. And frankly, we just don't have a market for a cruise ship terminal. The cruise companies love their seven day turn. It's, you know, they can sell that to customers very easily. People like to take a week long vacation. So if you depart uh, Seattle or Vancouver on Sunday and you get into Anchorage on Saturday, you can fly home, you've got your nice week long vacation, right? Uh, and then what they do is they will, they'll do a seven day cruise in order uh, to do a seven day cruise, they start in either um, Vancouver or Seattle. They sail up, make their stops, and then they end in either Whittier or Seward. They get off of the, uh, the cruise ship, get onto a bus or a train, come to Anchorage, and then they can fly home. And in the meantime, they've flown the next group of passengers up to Anchorage. They use the same bus and train to get them down to Seward or Whittier. They load that group of passengers up and they sail them down. So they get the book seven days up and seven days down. It's a, it's a lovely trip for packaging purposes. Um, and they can sell it all day. Um, in order to come into Anchorage, you have to add one to two days of sailing time, a day up, a day down. So depending on how you're counting, uh, in order to get to Anchorage. So it messes up that seven day turn. Um, and then on top of that, frankly, you know, Upper Cook Inlet is not a particularly scenic uh, sailing route. So they're not going to come to Anchorage in big numbers. The, the trips that come to Anchorage are one-off uh, visits. We're going to have 14 visits uh, this year. Um, that's well under 1% of the Alaska cruise ship visits. It's, it's a fraction of 1%. Um, and it's a, it's a, the trips that are coming here are these sort of oddball two week long trips that are, they just have a different clientele in mind. So yes, we handle cruise ships, but we'll never be a big cruise ship destination. Right, I tend to agree with all that you said. That's, that's not really what sells well. There's plenty of ways to get to Anchorage and you needn't come here by ship. Yeah, or defer tourism. But I'll tell you, you know, we're very efficient with our, our cruise ships. We pull them up to the cement dock and then we use the dock cider. That's that giant vacuum cleaner they use for offloading cement. We put the nozzle right down into the uh, cabins, suck the passengers out and drop them right onto the bus. We can <laughs> offload a cruise ship faster than sewer can easily. Great. There you go. World, world class. Um, Alas, not sarcastic, an interesting wrinkle too. You'd mentioned, and we've had other talks, I think, by you on the military focus and my, minor arms reach funding. They, they are trying not to be the funder of uh, Port of Alaska. 
uh, yet they still wanted to be active and they want to be able to command access to the port in times of emergency when they wanted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think you'd already said you, you're tapping them. You're some minor success in being able to get some funds, but, um, well, we've gotten Department of Transportation funds. We have not had any money from uh, Department of Defense. But the interesting thing with the Department of Defense is in order to become a strategic port, uh, we have an agreement with the military in terms of what we can provide. So we, for instance, have to be able to provide 25 acres of lay down yard on very short notice so that they can uh, set up a deployment. Um, we need to be able to, in our agreement, they want us to provide 2,200 feet of dock face so that they can bring two military LMSRs up to um, load those uh, military vessels and get out and do a deployment. Say, you know, we're going to invade Korea or something like that. Uh, if you're going to invade North Korea, Alaskan forces are going to be involved. They need to be able to get all that equipment from Fairbanks and from J Bear. Um, down to the port, stage it up, and then load it onto two vessels and then you know, send it overseas. Uh, we did a deployment last, uh, I think it was August, where um, they said, okay, we're going to test this system out and see how it works. So they brought two LMSRs up and they had, it was about 3,600 pieces of equipment, both from Fairbanks and from Anchorage. Uh, they had no problem getting the equipment here. They had it all staged up and ready to go. Their plan was two and a half days of loading time. Uh, what they hadn't accounted for was our 30 foot tide flux. Uh, and what they discovered was that the roll on roll off ramps that are on their transport ships only work when we're at plus 28 feet or higher uh, for the tide. So what that meant was their two and a half days of loading time became a week in order to load those ships up. Um, and, you know, there was all kinds of finger pointing, but what it really came down to is Alaska is a really complicated place to do a deployment. And if you don't have very specialized equipment, you're not going to do it quickly. Um, so they're now going, hmm, what do we have to do to fix that? Um, they haven't come up with a solution. Meanwhile, we're going, hey guys, you want 2,200 feet of dock in order to be able to put two ships up we don't need 2,200 feet of dock in order to support Alaska's commerce. We can get by with, say, 1,700 feet of dock. Um, who's going to pay for that extra 500 feet? And I've had a constellation's worth of stars on, you know, the collars of generals and admirals come across this dock. Every single one of them goes, yep, this is absolutely necessary infrastructure for um, Department of Defense operations in Alaska, in the North Pacific, in the Arctic. Um, they will all write support letters for me in a on a moment's notice, but they don't have a checkbook. So that's my problem. There, there is not a Department of Defense uh, resource <coughs> writing checks to support a commercial seaport. Now, we're all open to all sorts of options. We've offered to say, hey, you want to own a dock? We're happy to let you own a dock. We can operate it for you if you want, or if you don't want, that's fine too. Um, and there are discussions being had about, okay, how can the federal government step in, pay for the federal portion of, you know, the, the federal need at this dock, um, yet not get stuck running a commercial dock? And basically what we need is some good ideas and uh, support to make that happen. This is a national discussion. Yes. I know that uh, with all of these strategic commercial ports. Uh, the, the reality is that the DOD increasingly asks for more and more, but it wants to pay for less and less. You know? and, and it's a bigger deal in Alaska than it is in, say, Tacoma. The Tacoma is also a strategic port. If Tacoma has, if, they, if DOD tells Tacoma, hey, we need 2,200 feet of dock, well, Tacoma has, you know, something like 3,500 feet of dock that they keep busy on a daily basis just with their commerce load. So for that once in a decade deployment where they, you know, DOD comes in and says, hey, we're taking over 2,200 feet of dock, Tacoma says, 
hey, customers, a couple of you are going to go have to hang out on, on the hook or go to another port for a week while the Department of Defense does its thing. And then they go back to keeping those docks busy and they're generating revenue from them as soon as that deployment's over. Here in Alaska, we don't need 2,200 feet of dock. So that means we're having to build and then maintain 500 feet of dock that is generating no revenue when the Department of Defense isn't using it. And that's, you know, economically really tough. Just for a sense of scale, Jim, so we're looking at the map uh, that shows uh, there on the right-hand side, the south float all the way over to the north-end side, right, this would be left-hand side with the north, extension. Mm -hmm. For a sense of scale, those two military ships, would they be roughly comparable to the two ships that are at T3 and T2? Um, yes. Uh, they're just very slightly longer. But when we did the deployment in August, that was about how much dock they were taking up. Okay. And, you know, the, the funny thing is uh, where you see T1, T2, T3, on the new case, that will basically be T1, T2. So we break it into three terminals, but given modern ship lengths, um, it's really two terminals. You know, ships have just gotten much bigger over time. Bigger. Our, our berths, for instance, are 35 feet deep. We regularly handle tankers that have need 40 feet, and the the marathons of the world would love to bring 45 foot tankers in because, but they can't because we're not deep enough. The way they can't bring in a 40 foot tanker is, okay, we have a 30 foot tide flux. So they'll play the tides. They'll hang out and then come in on an incoming tide, tie up, hook up, start pumping like crazy. And by the time we go back down to low tide, they no longer need 40 feet. They only need 35 feet. They've offloaded enough product. And that works great, except when it doesn't. Um, so what they would love to do is have us uh, have a deeper berth so that they could bring the fuel in on bigger tankers. Why do they want to bring bigger tankers in? Bigger tankers are cheaper. So ultimately, that's good for Alaska consumers. Um, and it's particularly good for Fairbanks. You know, the, the trick is when you're, when you're playing the fuel game, you know, there's we all know that international fuel prices are really volatile, right? They go up, they go down, they go up and down a lot. The marathon fuel are playing the game so that, you know, they want to buy low, fuel prices are low, and sell it when it's high. That's how they make the most money. But the game's actually a lot more complicated than that because it's not just the fuel price that they're worried about. They have to optimize between, between three things. They have to optimize between fuel price tanker availability, and then tankage. So they just bought, you know, uh, the tank farm up in North Pole. So Marathon now has a lot more tankage. They have tankage down in Nikiski, they have tankage here in Anchorage, and they have it up in North Pole. So they've got lots of space to store fuel in Alaska. Um, we all see the international fuel prices and how they go up and down. The thing we don't see is tanker costs. And tanker costs are just as volatile as fuel costs are. So the availability of fuel and how much fuel they can carry. So what Marathon wants to do is they want to uh, rent a tanker when it's at when tanker costs are low, buy fuel when fuel costs are low, and then get it into Alaska in as few trips as possible, and then distribute it among their tanks here so that when fuel prices go up, they can be selling out of their tanks rather than having to be importing new fuel. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, you know, it's a really complicated game. You, you sit there and go, okay, I get it. But then when you start watching, you know, the, the game cycle for how, how they're making their decisions, it, it just starts to numb your brain really fast because there are so many factors coming in. Yeah, it's calculus, not arithmetic. <clears throat> so regarding the uh, estimated bond necessity of say sixty-five to seventy million dollars, and again, this is for this is for completion of the petroleum and cement berth. 
Yep. That's the one that uh, is straight off of that dome. So the dome is our cement dome that Alaska Basic Industries, ABI, owns. Um, and uh, that will only handle cement and fuel. So it's no container traffic at all. But what it does is it, it actually probably has enough volume to handle all of our fuel needs. Um, although it would be really tight. But that will let us uh, demolish POL1 and T1 so that we can start building a new container terminal there. You know, part and of for our- for accommodate- Go ahead. Sorry, go on. I was gonna say part of our trick is we have to keep all the docks open. You know, we could build this dock a whole lot cheaper if you folks up in Fairbanks and us folks down here in Anchorage would just go without food for a year. <laughs> Because then I could just pull the portion of the dock, knock it down, and build a new dock. But because we want to keep everything open, people want to keep eating, I need to do this in such a way that I always keep the same amount of dock available. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're building a new dock at the south end, and then we're going to move north for the demo build, demo build model. Uh, and when we're done, we'll have sort of the same dock that we have today, except built the modern standard. It'll be about 150 feet farther out into the ocean so that it's in deeper water and it'll be about 400 yards south of the current dock because we've moved south and then worked north. And that just answered the question I was going to ask as far as uh, how we were going to accommodate the larger ships. So, so again, uh, probably, you know, rather than just increase dredging, we'll extend the dock into deeper water. Exactly. Um, and is there less dredging at the, those farther out, you know, and deeper? Oh, that is a great question. And, I, and I, I say it like that because if you ask six different engineers, you'll get seven different answers. Uh, <laughs> what it's going to do to our dredging. The basic answer is everybody says it will require less dredging. But when you talk to, uh, when you start looking at the details, the estimates are somewhat less stress dredging to a huge amount less dredging. And you, you know the real answer is probably somewhere in between there. But if that's true, then it, it's lower operating costs. Yes. It, well, yes and no. Um, and here, now I'm going to say this as a cynic. Uh, it is, you're correct, it is lower operating costs in that we will have to dredge less. However, uh, Port of Alaska does not pay for its dredging. Um, Ted Stevens wrote a, a law back in the early, I guess it actually was the late 80s, that basically got Port of Alaska dredged, um, requires the Corps of Engineers to dredge up to the dock face um, so that that is not an operational cost that Alaskans have to bear. Um, so it would really be a federal savings in order to do that. Um, now. Is that part of a justification for why the feds ought to help pay for moving it? Because we'll reduce operational costs going forward? Probably. Cool. We love Uncle Ted. Still. <laughs> Still. Yeah. <laughs> the gifts that keep on giving. Yes, gifts, whether we know it or not. Okay. And that's not an incident. We're, I mean, we dredge in cubic yards a year. We are the most dredged port in North America. Right. Oh. So I, I, have, I have a question. Please, Ms. Shepard. Um, and you were just making me think with the, uh, the volume of dredging that occurs there and the issue of additional layout, laydown space. Has it ever been considered to uh, expand the footprint? through dredging? Uh, yes, and it won't work. The, the silt that we're dredging up um, is, it's not a, it's, it cannot be stable enough, uh, especially given our seismic conditions. And in fact, what we have to do, basically all of our mud flats and tidelands are the same silt, and we have to get rid of that and fill it in with gravel in order to build a stable pad that's not going to liquefy during an earthquake. Um, so it's a, it's a great thought. It just doesn't work, unfortunately. 
So I guess the final question, is there anything pending before the legislature at this time? Um, that yes. Be keeping an eye on? Uh, there is a move afoot to have some sort of a statewide general obligation bond this year. And the notion is that this project should be a, the container dock in particular, should be a significant portion of that general obligation bond because of the fact that because of its statewide impact. I mean, realistically, there is not a corner of the state that does not benefit from Port of Alaska's use. Uh, it's Port of Alaska in Anchorage, but it is not, you know, even though it's an Anchorage department, it benefits the state, uh, its site or its uh, military use and its um, resiliency, disaster recovery as a state service. Um, and if we get a general obligation bond out there, the idea is that Port of Alaska should be a significant. Um, so and as we discussed it, it up, that would be the thing that we would want support on. Right. So we discussed at some length the cost right now again of the uh, petroleum and cement berth. Uh -huh. But if we were going to do a geo bond that would include funding for the commercial sections, the container what document. would you be talking about as far as uh, estimated total well, total value? It's really hard for me to give you a number on that until I know what I'm building. So, you know, uh -huh. one berth, that's clearly going to be cheaper than building two berths. It's not half the price. It's, you know, three quarters of the price because you have to build facilities into it. But, you know, realistically, we're probably talking uh, anywhere from 800 million to a billion dollars for the remaining infrastructure that needs to be built. Um, and you know, Say that again? Somewhere, I'm guessing somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 million to a billion dollars for what's left. Got it. I, okay. That sounds about right. Okay. Um, you know, so the one other piece that's out there is we have the, uh, the Port Intermodal Expansion Program, that's the Sheffield project, the failed project. Um, not only did that project fail, it actually created quite a bit of repair work that still needs to be done. It did this north extension that uh, is seismically unstable. And while we, uh, we're not making any money on it, it is preventing us from building the uh, new container dock because it's in the way, it's a navigational hazard. So we're going to have to remove some of that. That uh, repair project is, depending on exactly how you do it, somewhere between 250 and 350 million dollars. Next week, we have a mini trial down in uh, San Francisco, where uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation's Mar Marine Administration, NARAD, uh, managed that project and let the contracts that you know, basically built that project. Uh, a more cynical way to look at it is Marad helped uh, set and take care of the bonfire that burned up $500 million. Um, and we, the municipality of Anchorage is trying to recover the money, not all the money that was burned up in that bonfire, but at least enough money to pay for the repairs. And we have the mini trial next week. Um, I don't anticipate that this mini trial is going to um, be a full solution, but I suspect that that lawsuit will probably be resolved this year, and we'll know if Marad's going to have to pay for the two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty million dollars worth of repair work. Got it. <coughs> okay. So watch your newspaper. So watch the newspaper. Okay, are there any further questions here in the room? Okay, I see none. Is there anyone online? I see one person remaining. Okay, well, Jim, it looks like we're all done. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, well, I hope that was useful. Very useful, and again, we're keeping an eye on this. We, we, we know that, that the bread and the butter come across the dock, um, and, it, and we, like, we like being able to eat. Uh, well, it's funny. The one thing is, I don't care if you're Republican, Democratic, uh, Fairbanks resident, and Anchorage resident, we all eat, and you know, we all need a source of food.
know, there's really no reason that we're not working together on this. Right. Okay. All right. Well, everybody who's still around, uh, just know that next week we have uh, lined up um, the railroad. Uh, since we talked a little bit about the railroad, uh, yeah, we're going to get a presentation, a, a nice railroad update from the Alaska Railroad. Okay. And so with that, again, Jim, as always, thank you so much for the update. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'll be reaching out. And, and do feel free to reach out as things progress uh, with for updates. Brilliant. Thank you. And I'll let thank you know you. When, uh, when the legislature actually starts talking about a GO bond. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be keeping an eye on it, too. Cool. All right, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, for the good of the order, everybody have a great day. Talk to you next week. All right. Bye now.